in the last video we talked a lot about uh, the diagnostic criteria for SLE, what it kind of looks like, how you diagnose it. We also talked about the etiology and pathogenesis, how it, how the disease actually, well, what's the current theory of how the disease happens. In this video, we're going to talk about the morphology of SLE, kind of what it looks like under the microscope and then on a macroscopic uh, level. So SLE is a systemic disease, as we discussed in the last video, with protein manifestations. Now protein, it does not have anything to do with protein. Uh, protein is just varying, means various, varying or different manifestations. So like we talked about in the last video, SLE can be seen in the kidneys, it can be seen uh, in the heart, in the skin, in the joints, all over. And so we're going to talk about some of those areas in which the morphology of SLE has been observed. So the most most characteristic morphological changes result from the deposition of immune complexes in a variety of tissues. Just a little quiz to see if you can remember what type of hypersensitivity disease is immune complexes. I hope you guessed type 3 because that is right. So as just a little reminder, there's an immune, there's a little antigen right here. This, you know, antibody comes over here, binds to it, which makes an immune complex. Well, then this immune complex is embeds, embeds itself in, in certain areas within the body. And then that causes inflammation and causes the tissues to be damaged. So the first one we're going to talk about is acute necroticizing vasculitis. So this affects the small arteries and arterioles. And in chronic stage, stages, vessels show fibrous thickening with luminal narrowing. So this is kind of a good starting point because this will describe a lot of the other pathologies or the other morphologies that we'll talk about. So it happens in the arteries or arterioles, and after a long time, you're going to get this fibrous thickening, and then the result, luminal narrowing. So this is an example. This is a kidney here. Let me see if I can get a darker color here. So this is the kidney here, and right here we see an interlobule arteriole. And in case you don't know what an interlobule arteriole is, I got a picture here of an artery. So you have the renal artery, the blood flow coming in, and then you have the renal vein, blood flow coming out. So how the kidneys work is we'll do a little physiology here is the renal artery comes in, it branches off, and it kind of and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. smaller. One of the smaller vessels as it branches is called the interlobule artery. And then as it even branches farther, it kind of turns, and that's called the arcuate artery or the arcuate vein. So there's a corresponding artery with the vein, usually in anatomy. And so that's kind of what happens. This is the cortex of the kidney, and right here in the pyramids are the medulla, where all uh, the process happens. We're going to talk about later how that happens. And as blood comes through this kidney here, or through the ar ar renal artery, interlobular artery, arcuate artery, then it passes into what's called a glomerulus or a nephron. And then there's nephrons and glomerulus. They kind of make up this, this pyramid or the medulla of the, of the kidney. And then the urine, all urine is is filtrate. It's just, you know, blood that's filtered to get rid of all, uh, you know, nasties and stuff that your body needs to get rid of. And so what happens is there is these minor calyces, which is like you just think of urine getting, I should probably use yellow, huh? Um, just, you know, yellow urine's getting dropped down right here, and then yellow urine's getting dropped right behind this artery and vein. Yeah, urine's getting dropped, you know, kind of right here. So these are called minor calyces, and then they make a major calyces, like several minor calyces make up a major calyce. So then you're having more urine. Urine's coming out here, urine, 
you know, urine, urine, urine. And then it comes down to the renal pelvis, which is right here where all of the major calyces collide. And then it goes down to the ureter, down to your bladder, and out your urethra. So that's kind of an anatomy, if you will, of the kidney. When you have these immune complexes embed themselves into this interlobular arteriole, there, you can imagine that there's a little there's a little immune complex that's embedded itself into the wall here, and then that starts causing inflammation. You know, cells are getting damaged. You can watch the inflammation videos to talk to see exactly how that happens. And your body is starting going to start laying down collagen or fibrin. And so this is starting to starting to be a little bit more fibrous, a little bit more thick. And so all this stuff right here is fibroid fibrinoid necrosis and and fibrous thickening of the arteriole, which over time is going to you know decrease this lumen diameter. And so that's why you get a luminal or this blood vessel to be narrowed. So there's not going to be as much blood passing through this is because it's going to be smaller. So that is acute necroticizing vasculitis. It happens all over the body. And this example, this was just an example of the kidney. And the reason why I chose the kidney is because kidney involvement is one of the most most important important clinical features of SLE with renal failure being the most common cause of death. So renal failure is the most common cause of death. It is rare in SLE, but nonetheless it is a cause of death. So now I'm going to move down to this picture. So as we talked about right here in the, let me just scroll up here. We talked about in this picture, this is kind of the anatomy of the kidney. We're scrolling down now to look at this kind of just we're going to cut this section out of the kidney, blow it up, and then what you see here is you see right here a right here a renal a renal corpuscle. And what this is is if you take this picture and you blow it up, then you get this picture. And so what happens on a microscopic level is you're looking at the afferent arteriole. What that means is where the blood is coming into the glomerulus. And then the efferent arteriole is coming out. E for exit. E for exit. Efferent. E for exit. Efferent. Exit. Arteriole is where the blood's coming out. And so you have the vascular pole here and you have the tubular pole on this side. And so as the blood's coming in, what's happening is that it's going to be is coming through these all this uh, uh, network here. And this the blood is going to be filtered. And so as you see in this picture over here, the filtration apparatus is you have, you know, if, the, if I just took a slice slice down here, then this is what would show up. These red blood cells are st they're they're going to circle around and they're not going to be filtered in. But all all the little molecules that can kind of squeeze out of here of these little holes. And remember this is kind of just like a meshwork in these pores right here. If they can fit through these little holes, they're going to be they're going to come out into this into this area right here. This area right here is called the capsular space. And so the glomerular capillary is going to cause filtration of all the small, the water and all the other little tiny things inside your blood. But the red blood cells and other big molecules, they're not going to be filtered and they're just going to keep going out the efferent arteriole. Now what happens is that the most clinical, most important feature of SLE is renal failure is because these immuno complexes right here, these little guys, this complex right here, gets embedded right here. They get embedded during these this filtration. Why? Well, one theory is, well, is because there might be a negative pressure pulling stuff out of here. These guys kind of might get, might get sucked up against this wall here, which are causing these to kind of 
plop up against this wall, these little immunocomplexes, which then might plug up the holes and then corresponding, uh, you know, like we talked about up here, you might get, you might get uh, inflammation and then you might get, you know, different kinds of processes. And so some of the parts of this this glomerulus apparatus or this glomerulus is the affer afferent material coming in and then so you know the the big the red blood cells and the bigger molecules are just going to kind of sweep around and they come out the efferent arteriole but you have mes mesangeal matrix which is we're going to talk about how that's important we have the mesangeal cell we have the parietal epithelial cell we have glomerular basement membrane we have Bowman's capsule or the capsular space. Bowman's capsule right here is kind of all the tissues right here, ba basement membrane, we have podocyte, and then we have where the urine's gonna come out is the proximal tubule of the nephron. And so why that's important, I just kind of wanted to review some of the anatomy is because we're going to talk about the World Health Organization has five distinct patterns of glomerular disease in uh, SLE, but none of them are specific to the SLE, but they they have been classified. So there's class one normal, the, it's normal by light electron and immunofluorescent microscopy, and it's less than five percent of the SLE patients that have class one. Class two is the mesangeal lupus glomerular nephritis, which has to do with these meningeal men mesangeal cells in this mesangeal matrix. 10 to 25 percent have this. There's mild signs and symptoms signs uh, that the SSX that means signs and symptoms in medical writing, medical terminology, medical shorthand. Um, class 3 is focal proliferative um, glomerulonephritis, 20 to 35 percent have this. And then class 4 is the most common type. If you get glomerulonephritis, it's the most common and it's also the most serious. 35 to 60 percent of patients have it, diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. And fortunately, uh, class 5 is the least common and it's membranous glomerulonephritis. So we're going to talk about all those and I just wanted to review this anatomy so that we can kind of get a better understanding of what's happening in the glomerulus so it makes more sense.